Hello, this is The Radical Reviewer, taking a look at The Economics of Inequality by Thomas Piketty, the Belknap Press of Harvard University Press, 2015. The key idea of this text is that there are many ways to address inequality, with subsidies for education, affirmative action programs, unionizing tax incentives to encourage real estate investment or charity, government jobs programs, etc., etc. Yet, all of these examples have one or several drawbacks. However, Piketty argues fiscal redistribution, that is, tax money directly redistributed to people in poverty, does not suffer these drawbacks and will be the most effective means of eliminating inequality. Let's take a look at the text chapter by chapter. Chapter 1, The Measurement of Inequality and Its Evolution. Piketty starts by looking at different types of income wages, self-employment, pensions, transfer income, and capital income. Although capital and labor inequality is very important, Piketty finds that actual inequality of income from labor, whether due to employment inequality or wage inequality, has thus increased in all Western countries since the 1970s. This reminds me of Michael Albert's argument that yes, capital versus wage inequality is very important, but the average person sees wage inequality more frequently because the average person sees more doctors, lawyers, district managers, etc. than they do capitalists. Piketty goes on to address some of the reasons for wage inequality, such as the loss of low-skilled labor and manufacturing jobs in the West, which has been met with an increase in prison populations. Chapter 2, Capital, Labor, Inequality. Piketty continues to critique the way the mainstream ignores labor inequality, stating, initially, the two terms of this basic inequality, capitalists and workers, are conceived as homogenous groups, and inequality of income from labor is regarded as a secondary matter. Piketty argues against an increase in workers' wages and instead argues for fiscal redistribution, stating, if one taxed the profits of firms, or capital income paid by firms to capital-owning households, one could finance a fiscal transfer or tax decrease to achieve the same redistribution of income to workers without increasing the labor costs of firms, and thus without triggering a substitution of capital for labor, deleterious to employment. In other words, if all you do is increase minimum wage, then you motivate companies to cut hours and or cut employment. But if you have fiscal redistribution outside of the relationship between capital and labor, then these negative side effects won't happen. Piketty argues that fiscal redistribution is better than price controls as well, stating it is more efficient to help the poor cope with high prices by means of fiscal transfers than by establishing price controls, because price controls lead to shortages and rationing. Here I would argue that shortages and rationing are part of the game. It's part of the capitalist system already. People are already priced out of several products, especially products society expects a person to have, such as new cell phone, new computer, things like that. The problem here is inflation. This is the closest thing I've found to an answer to my main critique of this text, which I'll address later. Piketty goes on to explain that direct redistribution only works where capital labor substitution is low or non-existent, i.e., raising the minimum wage works best when the job can't be replaced by technology. This issue has become apparent in recent years as everything from forklift driver, cashier, waiter, and even storefronts in general can be replaced by technology, as CGP Gray's Humans Need Not Apply certainly demonstrates. Piketty argues that fiscal redistribution must come from high-wage earners and not the economy as a whole, because as it stands, low-wage earners bear the brunt of social services. As Piketty states, it is therefore clear that social charges are not paid out of capital income. This is a crucial fact, since it implies that modern systems of social protection, which are central to today's systems of redistribution and which are based on the idea of dividing the social cost between capitalists and worker have not, in fact, redistributed income from capital to labor. Labor income has absorbed the full cost, to which Piketty includes, the only way to redistribute income from capital to labor is to tax capital. Piketty then talks about the credit market as a means of alleviating poverty. Piketty 
doesn't address limited access to information on investment opportunities as a barrier the way many have argued, i.e. that there is equal opportunity to invest, yet only the very rich have access to mathematical geniuses and market analysis geniuses. Rather, Piketty refers to the first world's failure at investing in the third world as an example of the failure of this solution as a whole. Piketty adds that even rich people in the third world make smart investments and invest in the first world rather than their own countries. Near the end of this chapter, Piketty defines his solution in this way. More generally, one could envision the imposition of a general tax on wealth. On coming age, each citizen would receive a check to be invested in whatever way he or she deems most profitable. To sum up, there is clearly no shortage of justifications for the transparent redistribution of capital and its income. My biggest problem with this solution is the risk that inflation will absorb the benefits and essentially no redistribution will have occurred. Chapter 3, Inequality of Labor Income. In this chapter, Piketty looks at various solutions for labor inequality and how they fall short when compared to fiscal redistribution. The chapter opens with Piketty explaining that income inequality is now more pressing and drastic than capital and labor inequality. This is because the tech boom and highly educated specialized labor make a vast amount of money while the disappearance of manufacturing jobs causes low skilled workers to be forced into remedial and service sector super low paying jobs. To this Piketty asks, Human capital inequality is at least partly the result of factors beyond the control of individuals, such as social background, natural talent, and unequal initial endowments. Under such circumstances, what is the best way to redistribute? Well, Michael Albert answers this question with balanced job complexes, where every task that takes place in a firm will be equally distributed so that not only highly paying tasks, but also highly rewarding tasks will be distributed equally among the workforce. But Ketty finds his solution in fiscal redistribution, stating, once again, the superiority of fiscal redistribution comes from the fact that unlike direct redistribution, it severs the connection between the price paid by the firm and the price received by the worker. Michael Albert has argued that the price system for labor is inaccurate, and he uses a doctor and a coal miner as an example, showing that the average person would prefer to be a doctor, not because the pay is better, but actually because of the dangerousness and etc. of the coal miner by comparison. And so it follows that coal miners in an accurate price system should get paid more than doctors because the work that they do is more onerous. Piketty takes this another way. He finds the price system of allocation for labor accurate and says that people's unequal pay can be a determining factor on how to structure fiscal redistribution. In other words, a doctor should get paid more and a miner should get paid less because then we know who to tax and who to distribute that tax money to. There is one place where fiscal redistribution lacks and that is in preferences and prejudice. As Piketty states, inequalities based on rank discrimination, such as between people of color and whites or men and women, are much more susceptible to remedy by affirmative action and changes in mentality rather than any kind of fiscal redistribution. Piketty also addresses unions here, acknowledging that they have played a pivotal role in increasing wages, benefits, and employee power in a firm's hierarchy, stating that there is no denying that the two Western countries in which wage inequalities have increased most since the 1970s, namely the U.S. and the United Kingdom, are also the two countries in which the power of unions has decreased most. However, Piketty argues that unions operate only within one firm and that they don't have the power to tax or do other broad-based redistributive measures that affect the economy as a whole, and so fiscal redistribution is still superior. Chapter 4, Instruments of Redistribution. In this chapter, Piketty explains that the rich and the poor benefit the most from tax revenues. For example, aid programs for the poor, and, and grants, contracts, bailouts, etc. for the rich. 
Piketty looks at other forms of redistribution that might be more effective, such as a basic income, but explains that basic income would still require some redistributive function from the rich because you can't tax the poor more than the basic income provides, and yet you will still have to get the money from somewhere. Piketty adds that certain tax breaks might essentially make basic income irrelevant, but Piketty ultimately concludes that fiscal redistribution is still the best policy. Piketty starts the chapter with what is essentially the argument of the text as a whole, stating, the primary tool of pure redistribution is fiscal redistribution, which makes it possible to correct inequalities due to unequal initial endowments and market forces while preserving as much as possible of the allocative role of the price system. Now, I think Piketty is accurate when he says that unions don't have the power to affect the whole economy, and so fiscal redistribution will be better and that minimum wage encourages firms to cut hours and so fiscal redistribution will be better, and that investments in specific programs are not helpful for everyone's needs and so fiscal redistribution will be better. I do, however, agree instead with Michael Albert that the price system of allocation is inaccurate and should be changed, which means the price system is a poor judgment of how fiscal redistribution could be distributed and I'm principally concerned that the gains made by fiscal redistribution will simply be lost to inflation. I might have missed it if this challenge was addressed in the book, but I didn't see it here. I think these solutions are better than nothing, but I worry that the ultimate solution of this text will fail because if a grocery store or a clothing store, etc., expects to receive a percentage of your income, they will inflate prices to reach that percentage if fiscal redistribution takes place. In conclusion, many authors such as David Harvey and many documentaries such as Inequality for All have demonstrated how the working class has artificially retained their purchasing power, only to have it absorbed in inflation and other means. First, minimum wage and unions increased a worker's pay. Then women joined the workforce to increase a household income. Then affordable higher education was used to increase incomes. Then the use of the credit system, refinancing your home. All of these help to increase the purchasing power of the poor, only to have that power exploited out of existence. My counter argument to the text goes as follows. If you currently spend and are willing to spend 10% of your income on food, and if the general population's income is to rise through fiscal redistribution, then the cost of food will also rise to once again be 10% of your income, and a firm will regain the profits lost through taxation, and no redistribution will have taken place. I did enjoy this book, and I feel like Piketty's critiques of modern forms of redistribution are accurate and correct and very important to understand. Although I don't see eye to eye with Piketty on his solution for inequality, I find the other critiques in this text more than reason enough to read the book. If you're interested in radical theory, looking for a book recommendation, or whatever, you can get your radical book reviews here with the Radical Reviewer. Thanks for watching.